simple task either. You don't know how great I am. You don't know. You don't know how. You don't know how great I am. I am what I am, and I am free. You don't know how great I am. Yo, check this. I might not be what you want me to be. You might not see what you want to see. But if you got a minute, listen to what I gotta say. 'Cause it's a brand new year and it's a brand new day. See, there's a gap to. Culture and the life that I lead. So some will call me an apple, and some a bad seed. They have no idea how my heart will bleed. The words and attitudes are things I just don't need. You don't know how great I am. I am what I am, and I am free. You see, I'm proud of who I am, and I'm proud of where I'm from. Those ones spreading racism, they're just fucking dumb. Now, if you're looking at my life and you say I've assimilated, just simplify things, just a little more complicated. See, I'm a modern-day native with a modern-day life. I have modern-day problems and modern-day strife. The natives, they talk about the past, and will I do the same? Fuck that. See, I've got no time to dwell on what's already done. I've got too many things that I want to do, and they don't include knives, and they don't include guns. I'm talking about knowledge and sharing it too. See, my people need to learn how to cohabitate, get rid of the anger, and get rid of the hate. We gotta stop for a minute and learn to educate. And you'll see in the end, we all have to communicate. I know there'll be a time to make a stand and a time to fight, but if you do that, make sure the cause is right. Because if the cause is right, and the cause is just, greater numbers of people will be backing you up. History is repeatedly shown to us all that united we stand and divided we fall. They were talking about natives and natives alone, 'cause this is a big world and this world is our home. Now I've seen some beautiful people and ugly ones too, and there's no single color that comes into view. So the message I'm sending, it's not all that long. This is, I want the human race to be stronger than strong. I said I just want the human race to be stronger than strong. You have to be strong. Done it. Word. You have to be strong. So go, Swag, Greg.
Gala Hindi Neo Gats, Wagi Sli Wagi, Niwaki Deloda, Oni Dog and Gwe Wenege, Ani, Bozo, Danse, Okinapi, Hau, and Yanko, Yukwetola, Skalanako. So, for those of you who have um, just joined us, um, I always uh, introduce myself in my original language. So, I said, Sigoli Swagwag, or hello everyone. Uh, Gala Hindi is my name translates to clouds passing over in the colonial language and i'm a member of the people of the standing stone first nations here on the northern part of turtle island that's been relabeled canada and within the confines of that definition i'm in a small section called southwestern ontario and i am bear clan and i said uh, or thank you friends uh, for joining and welcome and i'm glad that uh, uh, you can be here so today, a couple of things we're doing. Uh, first part of t what I'm doing today is a uh, we're going to be uh, I'm waiting for the Zoom to start here, but we're joining in on a talk by uh, Santi Smith. Um, Santi is a multidisciplinary artist who is from the Ganagahaga Nation or the Mohawk Nation uh, of Turtle Island, um, and she is Turtle Clan. Um, and she's from the uh, Six Nations of Grand River, um, which is, again, in southwestern Ontario, which uh, many of you may have heard me uh, talk about before. And we're, um, Zoom, we're, we're essentially uh, sharing content from the uh, traditional lands, uh, treaty lands of uh, the treaty of di one dish, the dish with one spoon. Uh, which is uh, the area for the Haudenosaunee, the Huron, Delaware, and the Nishinaab nations. And so um, I am currently just uh, I logged into the Zoom, and we're essentially just waiting for them to s spark it up. Uh, it should be starting any minute now. Now, this should last about an hour and a half, approximately. Um, I'm I'm thinking she's going to probably talk for an hour, maybe half an hour questions. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how to, what to expect from this um, because um, it was very vague, the description. But uh, I think that that's probably the usual format for, for these types of things. And then um, I'm going to take a break after this discussion. And then we'll be back at uh, 6 o'clock to start our uh, Indigenous Music Night. So um, if you want to uh, grab drinks and snacks and friends and kick up your feet and just enjoy some music, um, we'll be back up after uh, at 6 o'clock after uh, I take a, take our rodent for a walk and um, and have dinner and that kind of stuff after this after this talk. So um, feel free to come back and join us for that. What I try to do when possible is I try to keep the commands up to date. So um, this is essentially kind of what we're doing right now um, is we're just waiting for Santee to, 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 spark, to start and sign in and get started. But then we also are um, um, going to say oh. recording in progress. Check. There we go. Let me get my face off the screen here.
Okay, so as you can see, they have the sound off at the moment. So the Wampum Learning Lodge actually is the same place where we just um, went to the graduation of Fab Feline. Um, We're running on Indian time. One of my elders once said, Indian time is when it's the right time. We start events, we start events and gatherings when the time is right. So if they haven't started, it means that the time is not quite right. you everyone welcome to the wampum learning lodge i apologize for the delay in starting i was just sitting here chatting with some new friends i didn't realize that i was supposed to get up here and get things started <laughs> just enjoying such a beautiful day so uh meta no kite indigenous house so uh hard working woman is my name and Anishinaabe Quayan now. I'm an Anishinaabe woman from a Kettle and Stony Point First Nation, Kiko Nandunjima, and Mijika uh, Dodem. Uh, Turtle is my clan, Anishinaabe Quayan now, and I am a, a woman from the Anishinaabe Nation. So I, I'm just welcoming you to the lodge. I'm so happy to see you all here on such a beautiful day. Um, my role here at Western is the vice provost and associate vice president for indigenous initiatives and it's an inaugural position i've been in the role for two years and just a bit 
And uh, so very excited to have uh, this beautiful space, this the lodge here at Western, which is the hub of our work for truth and reconciliation. Uh, our work is informed by a very uh, robust Indigenous strategic plan and also informed by Western's institutional plan called Western at 150. And a significant theme in the work that we do pertains to the work of reconciliation. And we come at that from so many different approaches, from holistic approaches, not from one discipline only, but from an interdisciplinary approach. And it's very fitting that we have this wonderful opportunity to um, have Santi join us today. And through creative, through her creativity, through arts, celebrate the work of truth, understanding, and then reconciliation. So I'm just so very happy to have the honor to welcome you here. I just encourage you to enjoy this beautiful space and the intentionality of it. Everything in this center has a purpose, and that is really to bring us all together to, in some instances, unlearn and relearn, but then move forward together on a healing journey. So thank you very much for coming today. and. Uh, Please visit our website where uh, if you go to Western Indigenous Initiatives Wampum Learning Lodge, there you will see uh, an overview of our programming and the schedule so that you can uh, come and join in with the programming that we have available for you all. Okay, so I think at this time we're looking to call up the Dean, Dean Michael Milde. Over to you. Okay. Apparently, you have to hold this so you can hear me. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, Christy. So my name is uh, Michael Nilde, and I am the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here, as well as the people who are coming to this event via Zoom. I'd like to thank Christy and her crew for welcoming us to the Wampum Learning Lodge. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenapawa, and Shantan peoples, on lands that are covered by the treaties of the London Township and Sombra of 1796, and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Now, as I've been doing these uh, land acknowledgements, I have taken to asking the audience, how many people here have actually read any of those treaties? Hands up. Wow, even here, even here. One day I hope that I will ask that question and every hand in the crowd will go up. Uh, I recognize that as a university and as the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, we have a special responsibility to uh, teach the history of this land and of the peoples who live on it. And I will say I have read those treaties and they make for very interesting readings. And I, I hope to, uh, we can all share those uh, someday. We have a lot of work to do in terms of anti-racism and uh, reconciliation. And so it is uh, you know, with a great deal of humility that we commit ourselves to that ongoing task. Thank you. And I'm gonna hand it over to the Chair of Visual Art, Alina Robin. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alina Robin, Chair of the Visual Department. I'm here to uh, introduce Kelly Green, who organized this great uh, event. I also want to thank our colleagues from the Office of Indigenous Initiatives for hosting the event here. Uh, it's actually my first time in the place, I'm very, very honored to be here. Uh, Kelly is the inaugural uh, Indigenous Artists in Residence in the Department of Visual Arts uh, here at Boston University with the support of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Uh, and as part of a role, uh, she did a lot, she organized a lot of uh, events like this one, so we're very grateful. Uh, she's been with us for two years, but I've been very um, productive, and she filled the department with her energy and dynamism, and we're very grateful to have her with us. Um, so Kelly Green is a multimedia artist whose work uh, includes painting, sculpture, installation, and photo montage. She is a Moak Oneida Sicilian ancestry, a member of the Six Nations of the Grand River, and a descendant of the Turtle Clan. Kelly began her visual art studies at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, where she moved with her family when she was a child. And she um, obtained a BFA 
from Western University. So this is our alma mater. So we're very grateful, uh, again, that she could come back and be with us for a little bit longer. Uh, Kelly has exhibited in Canada and the United States uh, for over 30 years now in solo and group exhibitions. Um, she's very much involved with the Woodland Cultural uh, Center, and she has exhibited around uh, other places uh, in Ontario and Canada and uh, the U.S. Um, you do so many things. <laughs> Uh, our art focuses primarily on environmental, Odinoshone, political, and autobiographical topics uh, using ironic uh, humor when possible. She is also very concerned about the alarming condition of our planet. And lately, she's been uh, working, uh, collaborating with the Ivy School of Business for a question of sustainability um, and the uh, uh, environment. Uh, so, Kelly, thank you so much for organizing this talk. So, I will. Hand the microphone to you. Thank you, Elena, for those kind and supportive words as always. And thank you, Dean Milday, for acknowledging the land that we're gathered upon and reading the treaties. Um, and thank you all for being here in person and online uh, for this very special presentation by Santi Smith, who's tr not only truly an amazing artist, who I'm so very honored to introduce, but I must say she is also superhuman. Uh, I'm letting the cat out of the bag that um, all of the artists and performers that I have invited during my residency, which has been an amazing experience and journey in my life, right up there with right after the birth of my children, I must say, but all the uh, presenters have also been superhuman, in my opinion. I don't know how many hours they have in a day, how many days they have in a year, but it's beyond my comprehension. So Santi's presentation is called Talking Earth, Inviting the Land to Shape Us. And in Santi speaks about her artistic work, life and creative process, which takes inspiration from her Lodina Shoni family legacy and vision to create and move in alignment with Ongwehowe Neham, our way of life, language, and to Kasastan Selagoa Seoyela. I'm going to quickly define those words, those Mohawk words, just a little introduction to a meaning. So Lodina Shoni means they who make the house, and that refers to six nations. They meaning men, house to the long house. And Gasastan Selagoa Seoyela means the great strength and power of nature. Santi's work is truly awe inspiring, and she seems to defy time as she prolifically produced diverse artworks and obtained prestigious accomplishments throughout her career. She is a multidisciplinary artist from Ganyagehaga. Mohawk Nation, Turtle Clan, Oswego, Six Nations of the Grand River. Santi trained at Canada's National Ballet School and completed physical education and psychology degrees from McMaster University and an MA in dance from York University. Her debut work, Gahawi, a family creation story, premiered in 2004. And one year later, she founded Gahawi Dance Theatre, which has grown into an internationally renowned company. Santi's artistic work speaks about identity, indigenous narratives, creative process, and representation. Her body of work includes numerous productions, and she appears in the Cool. <laughs> She spearheads international Indigenous collaborative projects. She is a recipient of numerous awards and commissions, such as Guest Curator Director of Toronto Live's Animated Performance Project, Gagui Dene, Digahawi, Call Response to Spring, and the Gardner Museum's Indigenous Public Art for Talking Earth 2022. Santi is touring her production based on the truths of Canada's first Indian residential school, Mashwal, 
which received five Dora Maver Moore Awards. Santi is a sought after teacher and speaker on the performing arts and indigenous performance and culture. And she is the 19th Chancellor of McMaster University. Santi's most recent production, Homelands, premiered just this past weekend at Harborfront Center. So as you can see, she is truly superhuman. So without further delay, it is my privilege and honor to introduce Santi Smith. Hold on. Hold on. Yahweh, thank you. Thank you so much for your introduction and for inviting me to come and share some words with you and about my work. Sego, Sewa Guego, greetings everyone. Santi Smith, Dagalunyakwa, Nyungya, Skyangihaga, Nivagoh Soden, Wagenyakta, Oswegan. And um, my Ongwahoe name is Dagalunyakwa, which means picking up the sky. And um, the older version to say Six Nations is called Oswegan. And Oswegan refers to the, um, um, the bubbling up of water uh, undercurrent. And so that's what is the traditional name of Six Nations. So Six Nations is a very contemporary name, but that's what we know nowadays. So thank you for the lovely introduction. I enjoyed having a tour of this um, facility and the beautiful imagery, some of which I'm gonna to talk to you, uh, talk about in my presentation. But before we begin, I would like to um, share some words with you, uh, the Ohandu Galua Deguan, because it is important as an affirmation but also it ties into some of the things that I'm going to talk about, especially in terms of our relationship with land and the communication with land and sustainability and just way of being um, with nature. Some of you may have heard this before, but this is, oops, I went over there. Okay, I'll pass on. <laughs> So I wanted to give greetings and acknowledgement to the creative living universe of which we all are a part of and that our minds and our hearts come together and, and think about these things, the connections that we have and interdependencies and to be grateful. We give greetings and acknowledgement to the people Ongwe hoe means the people or the real people. And if you study the root word ongwe, it means human. And ongwe means forever. So another way of looking at human beings is people of the way of forever. And that means people who are nature made, who are creation made. We are made of land and waters and all the elements. So we acknowledge our ancestors, our family, friends, our colleagues, all people. We give greetings and acknowledgement to Mother Earth. She, she provides us with everything that we need to survive, to thrive. And we want to remember and embody and acknowledge our umbilical connection to Mother Earth. Una. We give greetings and our gratitude to the waters, and that's the waters, all waters, streams, the waters flowing in our bodies, and water is life. We give our greetings to the fish life, where they provide us with everything, sustenance, purification of the water, beauty. We give acknowledgement to all of the plants, medicines. We acknowledge the purification, the sustenance, and also the beauty of the plant life. We give greetings to the insects, all of the insects who help to pollinate the plants, 
provide us with sustenance. So be it in our minds. We give greetings and our gratitude towards our sustenance foods who nourish us and provide us with energy and sustain us. So be it in our minds. We give our greetings to all of the fruit for providing us with sustenance. We give acknowledgement to all of the animals, many who sacrifice their lives to sustain us, who are the greatest teachers that we have, who we um, emulate and, and how to live in balance with the world. We give acknowledgement to all of the birds for their beautiful singing and uplifts our spirits and also for sustenance. So be it in our minds. We give acknowledgement and gratitude to the trees, every tree in existence. We give thanks uh, for providing us with the oxygen that we need to survive and a lot of the times medicines as well. So be it in our minds. We give acknowledgement to the circulating winds who travel the earth bringing new life and new breath. So be it in our minds. We give acknowledgement and greetings to Grandfather Thunderers to provide us with activation and energy and purifying of the land and purifying of us as well. So be it in our minds. We give acknowledgement to the eldest brother's son who travels in a cycle every day with consistency to protect us and provide us with life, so be it in our minds. We give acknowledgement and greetings to Grandmother Moon for her powerful pull on our cycles on water and our connection to women and birth, so be it in our minds. We acknowledge the stars, the cosmos, for providing us direct, with direction and light and beauty, so be it in our minds. We give acknowledgement to spiritual teachers who provide us with guidance and direction. So be it in our minds. Datsi de wanuwalado ne kant sant stant for la goa sa oyela. Etonayon to hagate ne goa ngula. We give uh, acknowledgement and greetings to all of creation, the great mystery, the great creation, the creative energy that exists in everything, in everywhere, and in all of us. So be it in our minds. So that's very um, short, extremely short <laughs> Thanksgiving. And I might have missed a lot of things, but you can add to things to be grateful for and to acknowledge. And I, it's an affirmation, not a prayer. It's an affirmation and rec recognizing our interdependence and that we belong as human beings to this web of life and um, the importance of balance between all of that um, and the acknowledgement of the, the creation, the creative energy. Um, means strength and um, means also um, uh, immense creation. So as human beings, we are the ones who have to be reminded to follow 
original instructions of creation and alignment. Whereas animals, they instinctively do that. We have to choose to be um, responsible and perpetuating this balance. So I wanted to start with that because later we'll circle around to what it, what I mean by inviting the land to shape us um, and my work inside of working with land in collaboration with land and in with clay, which is also land, pottery. And um, so I just want to go through a little bit of um, a background of, of Talking Earth. I see some of you here might have already known a little bit about Talking Earth pottery from my parents. <laughs> But I wanted to start, I always like to start with acknowledging my ancestors and the powerful women in my, in my ancestry and the importance of using creativity for um, providing um, sustenance for the family. So this is my great grandmother. She's a um, guy in Gihaga. She was a midwife. She's working here in picture with corn husks. She was making um, different things out of corn. Uh, she was a clan mother. She was also a farmer. She cultivated the land. Um, and um, so she was a really strong matriarch in our family. And it's somebody who I'd never met. I never met her. Uh, or maybe I was just a wee baby. Um, but it, 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 she's somebody who I look to. Even before I go to a performance, I, I remember her. And, um, and uh, call on strength from her. And my other major inspiration is um, my paternal grandmother, Aldebon Smith, and she uh, revived the last art of pottery making in the community of Six Nations. So at a certain time, um, when people start using pots and pans for functional wear, they stop making pottery and for vessels, for cooking, for you know containers and everything like that. And... Um, and really, she took it upon herself in the 1960s to start looking at shards because we would be, you know, finding shards or finding pieces of pottery. And you could see them in museums and massive cabinets of pottery. And um, so she went to a museum. She did her independent research. And then she dug her own clay. She went through that whole process. And then she also learned contemporary style, throwing on the wheel. And she taught um, people in Six Nations. Um, and then she created a, uh, a little collective called Mohawk Pottery. She was also a um, very talented woman. Uh, and so who, she's somebody who in, informs my work as well as my, my family. And this is her. Uh, I like to show this photo because this was a piece of pottery here that she gifted Queen Elizabeth at Expo um, 1967 in Montreal. And I think it's important to note what she etched on the piece of pottery. She etched um, wampum belts. And it was, uh, it was her way of reminding the crown of our treaty obligations. <laughs> Do this beautiful piece of work. Let's be reminded of the the relationship building that needs to happen and ongoing. And so in, in that way that that it really sparked this sense in my family from her to my parents and to me about how creativity, how art can be um, a way of um, educating, increasing awareness of activating concepts and ideas and and also um in a in a more in a gentle way so as an artist this is this is the this is the path for me um and then my parents continued on after that and they created talking and pottery which i also um worked at I like to show this one too because this is my first piece of, well it's not my first piece of pottery i think i did this and i was maybe five years old, <laughs> but you can see I was still doing wampum belt designs. So that was really important. This was the, uh, like a friendship belt uh, representative of the people holding hands. You might see that somewhere in this building. Um, these symbols that really are encoded knowledges. So when, I, when we look at symbols, even these symbols up here, that's encoded knowledges. I have, I have pottery symbols etched into me. 
um, that speak volumes. You know, we didn't write things in um, books. And there, there is a um, belief that um, things were not to be written down because if it was written down, it could be changed. It could be forgotten. Our knowledge need to be written in our heart. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, oral history was really important because you have to live it. You have to, you have to hold that knowledge in your body, not just on a piece of paper that could also be burned or destroyed. So that, that's a little bit of con concept. So even etching on the pottery, that's encoded knowledges of, of natural pathways, of our topography, of our way of life and understanding of energies. So fast forward until last year, uh, I was commissioned um, to create a large scale ceramic um, sculpture which sits outside of the Gardner Museum. If you've been to the Gardner Museum, it's right across from the ROM. You, I'm standing there dancing, but right beside it, that large piece of pottery, that's that's my sculpture and it stands about this tall. It's a per, part of the permanent collection. And it's also, um, it's a fractured piece of pottery. So intentionally we fractured it as a representation of um, intactness and fracture and and also you know the finding of shards the the fracture the knowledge held within a shard um and the coming together of those knowledges um but also as i was discovering this um i came to really uh, resonate with the beauty of the fracture because a lot of the times in the work that I do was, you know, residential school, um, working with survivors and a lot of trauma and fracture and colonial um, implications of fracture. But there's such beauty in that as well that, um, and that's what I wanted to uh, showcase there. Uh, inside of the piece of pottery is uh, internal lighting. So in the evening, um, light shines through the cracks. And that is um, also to to beautify and to show the power of that coming together and holding still of those fractured and knowledges coming together. And then um, this is my daughter down here. She was uh, performing with me and she, she's hand building a piece of pottery right there. And she's got, she's clayed. And over the course of the performance, I go from just um, normal to being clayed completely. And uh, we 3D projected mapped onto the facade of the Gardner Museum. All, some of our family history, so my grandmother's things, my dad has got, we've got a photo, uh, video of him throwing a piece of pottery, some of the etchings, and um, really sort of honoring that family legacy of pottery and that connection to earth. And the, the title Talking Earth is, um, Kate was my, my, my mother and father's, and they came up uh, with that as the name for their pottery. And I think it's really telling in that um, the earth speaks to us. Like we are, they were creating these vessels from the earth, but, and then designing and coding knowledges on it, but the earth was also speaking forward. Um, and that idea of, of lis listening uh, to, to the earth. So that is a little bit um, about talking earth. Um, here you can see in this photo that I do work with shards as well. So though this piece here covering my eyes as a, sh a shard, ancient shards, I have a sort of a collar of a shard and then I'm holding shards. Um, and that, that is coming onto the body, um, representing that, that fracture, um, but also the beauty of it and the, the sense that for um, my family, and I think for a lot of Ongwahoi, pottery making and working with earth is very feminine. And traditionally, mostly women would have been the pottery makers. And um, the shape of our traditional pottery is in the shape uh, of a woman. So we have the, um, maybe I could go back. You can sort of see it here, sort of like the belly of the pot here is a container like the womb contains and holds things, life, food, sustenance. 
traditionally there like this the pot that i did there would have a pointed um rounded bottom because we didn't have tables they would have been you know um swiveled down into the earth uh and that would be that connection right into the womb into the earth and the neck you could you actually call the pottery the neck it's this this part and then the, the this here is the four pointed four cornered traditional vessel and that's the head and then the top part is open to the sky so that would be the openness up to the sky so my father in particular really viewed his work as um making vessels that were very feminine that represented women and that's really important even the uh thanksgiving we acknowledge mother earth and that that is a feminine entity um yeah and then i as a dance performer like being covered in clay <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to do <laughs> um just because of that uh connection of putting the earth onto yourself it's part of our creation story so our creation story we are made of clay we are we are made of clay and so that really is me embodying that story. But over the years I've working with clay and performance, I have been working with the idea of clay woman. And she appears in many of my works. And it's it's not it's a common theme, especially in cultures that work with clay. And um in the South, there's a lot of waters in the South. So that idea of clay woman is um I think an ancient symbol. Here's another photo. Oh, this is this is a little clip. So this is so so um uh, this uh, this is a little clip from last summer's premiere at the Gardner Museum, and then we're going to be remounting it in June twentieth and June twenty first. So we'll be back at the Gardner Museum to do the performance of it. If you're in Toronto, that's a good time to come to the Gardner Museum. <laughs>
that's a little bit, it's very meditative. It's a, it's a performance installation. That's what we call it. So it's very, um, um, well, when the space, you see that it's starting at sunset and by the end it gets dark and you get to see the, the um, video. So that's a little bit of, about um, that journey of the clay talking earth. But it really um, takes me back into some of the creative process and some of the research that I enjoy doing um, and continue to learn it, learn about how to embody Ongwehoineha. And Ongwehoineha is all of the things that are traditional ways, songs, or dances, language, governance, um, uh, mindset, uh, everything that is done in our uh, pre-colonial ways. And, and um, as an embodied performer, as a performer, I like to be physical. It has to come into the body. It can't just stay as the intellectual concept. And even in this Thanksgiving address, we, we repeat that word, so be it in our minds. That mind-body connection is very important. And um, when we're thinking and working in that way, uh, some of these questions can be um, asked. Uh, what is our what is our ecosystem? How do we create and structure our our um, any program that we're building? How do we build sustainable relationships? What does our space look like? And this is an example, I would say, of following um, you know the way the ways of uh, organizing our uh, space. Um, what does growth look like in a sustainable way? So for, for me as an um, artistic director of a company, growth does not mean exponential growth or more, bigger, more, more, more. It is to be expanding and contracting in a very natural way. And as you know, exponential growth is, is ultimately in, leads to imbalance. So that's... Uh, you know, lots of research, tons of research you can do about this. Um, and through the work that I do in designing on physical pottery and through developing choreography and movement and uh, working with um, indigenous dramaturgy or creating from a way that comes from uh, indigenous understanding as opposed to your Western understandings on theater or whatever practice you're doing, um, some of these really resonate with what, what I have been researching, pattern re uh, recognition and literacy. That's all of these things here, the patterns that we have, the iconography and the symbols. Um, the really important one is universal natural force or law. Um, and my parents and a lot of the, uh, my elder teachers would say, um, only follow the natural only follow the natural law, natural for anything man-made um, can be broken and changed, uh, but you can never change natural law. It is, it is, <laughs> it is life. You cannot change it. And so that's what we follow. Uh, or we try to be in sync with it. Um, that everything is creative uh, energy. We're all energies. And when we're looking at the way of being sustainable and acknowledging our interdependence, that what we create, is it reciprocal, uh, regenerative, sustainable, and the importance of um, as human beings, and especially as women being life sustainers uh, and thinking forward to the next generations, uh, collabor collaborations and responsiveness. Uh, respond, responding uh, to land. And in my choreography, I like to be in a call and response relationship with land. When I go out to the land, that it's a giving and receiving. And that's really important to do because a lot of the times we've forgotten how to listen and respond to nature being in the land. And it's not a simple task to do. It takes time and investment in doing that. Um, and so this is, this is just a little bit of some of our Ongwehoaneha, um, planning. 
<laughs> this is very rudimentary. This is from way before, but you will see that it has more of organic. Um, it's based on a branching um, uh, energy, and and we'll keep working in this sort of way. Um, and the the focus then is on natural patterning. And many of you might know all of this, but I like to just just quickly go through. Um, I use this in all of my work. I use this in the studio. When I'm dancing with, um, with uh, my dancers, we will look at a scene and we'll say, okay, how is branching coming to this? Um, or how are, how, how are spirals? Or this scene is really about water and this scene is really about um, the uh, um, or branching. But then you can go and you can see. So this, everything is represented in nature. So branching the lungs. And, and you can go on and on and on and on. And then you can look at our, our symbols, tree of peace, roots of white roots of peace. Those are fundamental Ongohoi understandings in our culture. And then you can go as, as an artistic director, then go, well, how does this, um, how can this be for the company? Um, how do we move people around? Um, how do we in intersect and on and on? Uh, so there's lots of research. And there's an example of the model and um, uh, these are universal. So there's many um, teachings around the world about natural pathways, uh, permaculture, um, perm uh, sort of contemporary per permaculture is really based on indigenous knowledges uh, because we had that for millennia in our lands. Um, here's an example of isolation. This structure right here is the strongest structure in nature. And I build choreography. I build um, choreography out of, out of that. Um, you look at basket weaving. Um, how do we organize our, our people in, in um, a way that's very strong? Um, how do we build our spaces? And everything is reflected in nature. There we go. Six pointed stars, nature, spirals. This is a really important uh, um, natural pathway. And we are basically made of spirals. We don't have a straight line in our body. We're all curvilinear and moving. So that's when we're dancing, we're moving in spirals, twisting, especially your spine to be healthy and to be moving in alignment and sync with the natural energy that is everywhere out there. And these, some of these symbols are, are very important. So this is a spiral, spiral right there on the, on the two outsides. You see that a lot in many indigenous cultures around the world and other cultures uh, really represents life, that uh, floral design, life, plant life. And this is where we talk about growth. It's additive growth, not exponential. Here's an example. We are made of spirals, sunflowers spiraling. And this was really, I, I like to work with um, uh, the knowledge of uh, Roxanne Schwenzel. She's also a pottery designer from New Mexico. He has a company called Indige uh, Permaculture Flowering Institute, and she uh, shares indigenous permaculture and um, talks about especially the, the spiraling aspect of something like a sunflower. And all those, spir all those uh, seeds in there are shaped in a certain way. And I like how she framed it. She said, uh, is it just that's the way they're shaped? Or is that the way the energy is moving through them? Will it shape them that way? And um, so that led me to a lot of thinking about what shapes us. And that idea of inviting the land to shape us. <laughs> what shapes us? I don't know. Yeah, and, um, and uh, so that became part of my creation creative process. is like going out into nature and allowing things to, to shape us. And I have a sunflower dance. Spirals, I'll quickly go. Here's a perfect example of a spiral over there. That's a um, slice of a tree. And the one important thing about that is the beginning spot. So that center spot and that centering point 
is really important because we we have centering points, our umbilical, um, and um, if we don't have a centering point, we might be like wobbling around, uncentered, un unfocused. So it's important that we see that continual growth in that way. And then also the ecological calendar. So uh, I, I plan my work around the ecological calendar, um, which is very, very uh, because because uh, everything we do follows the cycles of the natural world. Here's some examples. This is our sunflower garden, which we dance inside of. Stacking, this is really important for when you're um, planting and uh, cultivating the land. Our ancestors knew about stacking. Uh, corn, beans, and squash are stacked in a certain way. And um, the really important idea of companion planting or relationship building, what goes together, what's nourishing each other. Um, and, um, and our ancestors knew all about that, that how, uh, what nutrients help something to reach its full potential. There's my garden from last year. I, I'm also, I am a, uh, I'm just, yesterday I was busy seeding. <laughs> so uh, I'm behind schedule because we premiered yes, uh, last week. Um, flow, flow is a really good one. Flow is the canopy of clouds, the canopy top part of the tree. And then a lot of times we'll so just go with the flow. And that is really what you need to do. Go with the flow because things will move and fluctuate like that. It's a bit of freedom in that is an example. So people might make sound, songs out of, 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 out of the tree line. Um, in Australia, they, would, they have things called song lines based on nature. And the wave uh, tells us about um, movement of energy. All right, so I think I'm coming to an end. There's so much to talk about. I was like, ah, I can put everything in. But <laughs> Which takes me to the final of homelands and what does that mean of working in land? So this is a, a clip. This is in Upper State New York, which is in our traditional home territory. And um, I was on location here at the um, SUNY New York 8th Forestry and Ecological Campus. We stayed there, and um, during that time, we were just exploring about being in the land, what we could do, and I ended up creating this portal, and it became a, an installation piece, and I was really interested in transformation, and again, Play Woman appears, so, and then, so I wanted to show this video, sort of like the research, that was the research for homelands, and, um, and then little clips of Homelands, which we premiered last this past weekend, um, which is a multimedia performance, which also has pottery in it, uh, because that is the theme of my work, is integrating all of these um, styles and forms. being a very primordial um, character of play woman.
everything has a purpose. So the, the, so the thing of three, you can't really see. So in the video, up at the top, there's three women at the top. So there was three women in the video and three women here, which again becomes this six. Um, the, the strength of the boats coming together. And it's the cast of our dancers. And um, we will be, we finished that, that we'll be remounting it in September at the First Ontario Performing Arts in St. Catharines as a part of their Celebration of Nations Festival. Thank you, Nyawe. <laughs> I think we have time for questions now. So we have questions can come from the um, from everybody here in the room, anyone. And I think there's some will be sending in questions online that we'll, we'll see if we can answer. Yes. Yes. How does that reconcile? Obviously, because the practice is can you tell us a little bit about that? Hmm. Yes. Um, so when I was little, I was in a series of accidents. I broke both my legs two separate times. So I ended up being um, put into ballet to strengthen my legs. But I was dancing before that. So I was one of those little kids who was just lost in a world of improvisation. And my grandmother, Elder Bun Smith, had a ballet teacher friend in Brantford. And when they were saying, well, she needs to strengthen her legs, and she just said, well, I have a friend. And of course, then I was a young girl and listened to music and ballet became a way for me to develop as a dancer. And then I excelled and then I went to National Ballet for six years. Um, but uh, when I was teen, I became disillusioned with replicating Euro stories, which I really, when you're thinking about identity and missing family and home and who am I, what do I want to do when I'm older? I really left the ballet world behind. I was like, shut the door on that aspect um, because it, it, because of those reasons. The other thing that I could say about that is um, when I went to the national ballet, I think I was maybe the third indigenous uh, student there. I think there was one, ahead of me and then Michael Gray Eyes who's uh, now an actor and myself I was there in the early 80s 80s to 88 yeah and um, when I went to the school my father said don't tell anybody you're indigenous or you're from Six Nations and there's a really so I didn't I didn't share anything when people asked me where I was from or who, I would say Brantford and that would be that would be it and um, really, uh, he did it for a number of reasons. First, because um, a fear of institutions and me being away. Um, my, his father and um, grandmother both went to the Mohawk Institute Residential School. So there was that um, fear of institution and fear of tokenization. Oh, we've got one native dancer. And then, and then of racism. And so that was his way of protecting me. But it also meant that I was even more removed from my identity. And so when I when I started to question that, and I just said, Oh, I'm just going to move home. Um, and that uh, really, that was my formal training. And when I moved into to creating, people asked me if I had contemporary dance training, like Martha Graham or Limon, but I don't, it just I went from ballet to um, improvisation and creating my developing my language. The very first works are very balletic because it stays in your body. <laughs> Even my legs now are, are still, they still, my muscles have formed in a certain way that is very balletic. And I, I'm able, but one good thing is I'm able to access that. So um, when I need to in a performance, so if I have to um, do spins or I want to spin, I, I can do that um, with that training. And, um, but then over the course of becoming choreographer and continuing to this day, I, I learned many indigenous styles from around the world and collaborate with indigenous artists so that um, I have a lot of tools that I can use when I'm creating. 
So for me, um, I couldn't ever really leave the ballet world behind because my body has memory of it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have I have a lot of shards at home because um, because of our family history we collect shards. So sometimes people will just like give they have shards laying around they'll just give us shards. So if anybody has shards, I'll take them. <laughs> and um, and so I never really used them before until I started using uh, doing the um, the performance work. But for the piece of the gardener, um, it was really funny because I was working uh, through the um, School of the Arts at McMaster University in the in the sculpture studio because the piece was like this and we had to make five of we made five of them because we had to, we knew in advance that we were going to have to create a large scale piece and break it. Um, so we had to have tests, you know, if you're a potter, you know, you have to have lots of test pieces and fire it and, you know, all of that stuff. So we were documenting everything on social media. You probably look at it. You could probably look at my social media now and you would see, and, you know, I'm intricately designing it and making the faces and it's coming along. And then at one point we, it was cracking. So it started to crack, but people were like, oh, it's cracking. So yes, it is. Just wait. <laughs> and then later we were like trying purposely to crack it. And people were like, oh, we're so sorry. It started to break. And we said, just wait. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, we had, to, we had to purposely crack it. And I uh, was working with um, uh, uh, Carmela Langales, who's one of the ceramic um, and profs at McMaster. And so we had like a team of people breaking this piece and we did it like you would cut um, stone with, with um, little bits of uh, nails. So we had like six, six people going nail, nail, nail. And slowly it cracked in the way we wanted it to crack, plus the ways that it cracked as it, as it did. Um, so that was a surprise for people that we were purposely breaking our pieces of the pottery. Um, there's a few attacked ones that we didn't have to break because if uh, you know if one didn't work out, we would have to do the other. And then we took it all the giant pieces to a um, company called and it specializes in stage staging props, and they made an internal armature, metal armature, to hold all those pieces together. So when you go in to see it, you'll see those big bolts in it because it's really heavy. It's over 300 pounds. Um, and for safety, you know, as a public art piece, it had to have some safety precautions. So, yeah, it was purposely um, that way. And then these shards, like the pictures, those are found shards. Those are the shards that we had in our, in our family collection. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any other questions from online or anybody other any other questions? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Moving as clay woman, mm -hmm. what does that do to your mobility? Mm. And you talk about fracture, but just uh, feeling that in my own body, I would think there would be restraint mm -hmm. or some restriction to your mobility. And so I just wonder what that is mm -hmm. like within moving within mm -hmm. clay. That's a good question. It hardens on yeah, you. Yeah, it does. So yes. we put the clay on wet and then however long you're, it dries and then it starts powdering off um, and cracking. If you have a thick layer on your face, <laughs> so you really feel ancient. Like I, when I'm doing that, I feel like, I've become this primordial ancient being and, and I really like that. Um, I started getting other dancers to do it now. So I'm never, but there might be a lot of play dances running around. Um, but, uh, you know, people have been doing that for a while. And, and um, for me, it really is you know, um, that connection to creation story and being made of, made of the earth. And it's, it is not 
uh, it is really what we are. We are sort of accumulations of what we eat, which comes from the earth. Like so, those those are all um, uh, realities that we that we are. And um, yeah, so it it's quite fun. Uh, in the video that we did, uh, we recorded, and I did go through that whole time of being completely wet clay to dry clay to hitting my body and like the clay dust was going into the air <laughs> and that was also beautiful and then um scaring people on my way home <laughs> like covered in the clay <laughs> yeah I'm wondering about the youth and the young people, indigenous. Are they coming out mm -hmm. to not coming out? I mean, are they are they are they joining mm -hmm. uh, the industry? You know, for uh, theater mm -hmm. and uh, cultural enjoyment enrichment. Yes, I would say so. I mean, it's small, but um, even homelands. Like these these two here, Katie, she is twenty three. So went to George Brown College for dance. And then I, I scooped them up after, you know, like, I have my radar out about who's dancing out there. And Farron is also, uh, has been dancing for a while, traditional dance, um, hoop dancer. She was one of the hoop dancers in Cirque du Soleil's Totem. Um, really beautiful performers. So, so that's what, for me, that's what I can do is offer opportunities for professional dancers. Um, and I think that um, it's still a handful of people across the land, but one thing to note is um, the sort of inequities that happen. Um, there is no Indigenous dance training program in Canada, if not North America. Uh, that is very specific to training um, in dance. There is a theater program, Center for Indigenous Theater, but it's not dance specific. And um, so, so there's lots of challenges for up and coming um, performers, but there's no access. And um, if they still, they would still have to go to sort of <clears throat> studios or, uh, um, colleges which don't specialize in Indigenous dance. So so it, it's more challenging. Um, and then for my company, we can off, we offer community workshops and labs, but it's not the rigor of a full-time program that you would need to train a uh, professional artist. So that's something that's always out there is like the inaccessibility for a lot. And the reality of maybe say somebody's living in the North and they want to train and there's no tra there's no training. So that still exists um, here. And that, uh, you know, that's, that's the reality of some of those systemic barriers. Yes. Hi, um, in working towards allyship, what is the way, um, Maybe you can offer some advice on how to incorporate um, Indigenous artistic expression in the form of education. Form of education. Um, well, I think exposure is really great and representation. Uh, so there's quite a few theater works. Um, the Howie Dance Theater has um, three, four works for young audiences. We have the mush hole, which we perform for young audiences and as a study guide. And, and so there's lots of those sort of opportunities. And I think it's in terms of the arts, it's really important that, um, that when um, people are looking for supporting allyship, that the creative impetus and the creative work is indi like indigenous led creatives um so there's work it's just sort of a matter of finding those and then um supporting what is already existing making opportunities for more of that uh, residencies bringing artists in um opening up space for people to create work 
So there's lots of things to do um, in terms of supporting uh, what's already developing in the communities. And so I would say that would probably be the go-to universities can, <laughs> can open space for um, uh, artist residencies, creation processes, land-based work. Um, yeah, so there, there's lots of work to be done. Um, but also knowing that that is initiated and in it's coming from Indigenous voice, body, knowledge um, in that way. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I just have a question about the Smith family and pottery at, at the Six Nations. And mm -hmm. is it still being made? Mm -hmm. And is there a hub for this? And uh, you, you have must have um, relatives and so on involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a, only a handful of people on Six Nations. One of them is my cousin, um, uh, Anthony Pottery. And my father was had, a, had his studio up until 2000, no, 2018 when he um, became ill and closed the studio. So what is really um, a great evolution is that since 2018, the pottery at our home was closed, it was just nothing, um, no pieces going out. Um, and then I was busy doing other things. My daughter's at university and my mom take care caretaking and so really we had the pottery studio which was a working studio in the gallery just sitting there like waiting to see if he could return and he's not able to return so it stays closed um which was really an awakening when i was able to come and do talking earth that that piece was just a surprise because um, one of my colleagues, Monique Mujica, who is a um, artist, sent me this call from the Gardner Museum and said, oh, you should, this looks interesting, you should apply. And I was like, oh, I'll apply to this call. And then, boom, all of a sudden I'm back doing pottery, but in a different way, in more of a sculptural way. Um, and then have since transformed the studio at Six Nations into a multidisciplinary studio, so it has a dance or open area for um, embodied work. And then also uh, part of the, like the pottery studio. Um, and we let, last summer we built an outdoor kiln. So we're making, um, we're firing outside. So my, my journey is now a little bit different from my father, which was more kiln work, um, the uh, throwing and porcelain. So now I'm working with, uh, you know, sculptural work. And um, this uh, summer we'll be working in the pottery again, but again, hand building, outdoor firing. And I'm working with McMaster University's research project. Uh, they are, um, they have been testing uh, the residue inside ancient shards for like what was in these pieces. So they've done that part of the research. And so this like, this week, <laughs> people are coming to uh, plan on, we're going to build pieces of pottery, um, we're going to fire them, and then we're going to cook out of them. So we're sort of doing this, and then they're going to be testing all of, like what's happening out of that. So that's something that I'm interested in, just as a person, and it just so happens that I'm able to support that work at McMaster University. Could I comment? Oh, yes. You hear? Yeah. I, can I comment on my experiences at Mc, as a McMaster Chancellor? So um, I had been, I'm a graduate. You have to be from McMaster, an alumna, to become a uh, Chancellor. And at the time, it was um, President Patrick Dean was the, was the president. And when he came on, he came to Six Nations like eight years prior, however long his, his um, tenure was. And then he met a lot of people and he met my, my, my father and my, myself and um, other artists or people in the community. And um, I have a lot of colleagues in indigenous studies like Don, Dr. Don Martin Hale, Rick Hill, a lot of the Six Nations based academics. 
and uh, Vanessa Watts Palace. And so over the years, I would do um, workshops or, te- uh, you know, guest teaching, never, never really like a full time teacher or anything like that. And um, in 2018, 19, I was a part of the Socrates project where we remounted uh, the Marshall, which was the, the work on the Mohawk Institute at McMaster. And um, and uh, it was like the January of 2019, uh, um, President Dean invited me to have a meeting. So I was like, oh, it must be another project I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting there and he said, oh, I would like you to consider being chancellor. And uh, so that was a surprise. So you have to be asked, I didn't apply. I didn't know anything about being a chancellor. And uh, so I you know, said, what, do you, what does a chancellor do? Because, you know, I don't even know what a chancellor does. Um, I remember, you know, convocating and that's, that's about it. And so they you know, told me the things that I had to do, an honorary position, every convocation. So I have to be, commit to every convocation. I have to be president because I'm conferring degrees and my name is on all of the, um, all of the certificates and uh, people don't won't get a degree if I'm not sitting there giving it to them so that I could carve into my years and um, I chair the honorary degree committee I work a lot of on that and anything else that I can do I give um, talks and addresses and other graduation ceremonies and then I am able to you know help um, different departments when they need to or bring awareness to certain things. When the pandemic happened, I did a lot, a lot of online um, uh, messages. You know, I did a message after the George Floyd. I did a message after, um, I can't remember now, other things where it's sort of just like hearing, you know, the, the sentiment and the view from, from Chancellor. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I can do. Uh, also, I have my own regalia now. So that was one of the first things that happened is I changed the regalia, which incorporated a lot of Ongwehoi beadwork and my Glengarry hat. And so that that um, shares a different perspective. When I give convocations, I say the Thanksgiving address and I speak about, you know, philosophy and mindset and things like that, which is... Um, I think people have responded to very well to hear that. I don't do land acknowledgements. Um, uh, when it when I did my first um, um, Remembrance Day address, it was the first time that they had mentioned or honored Indigenous veterans. So these little shifts of awareness is is what what um, I can do, and also then just the work that I put out into the world gets. Um, uh, as an artist, as an individual, gets uh, uh, in- increased visibility, and um, and I think that's you know they made a different choice as a working Indigenous artist as Chancellor. That's that's you know quite a bit different um, than uh, other choices. I think. Oh, one question from online. Yeah, we have a question from the Zoom audience. <clears throat> it's coming from a guest named JP Longboat. Um, they're asking this question as a Haudenosaunee person. Um, they ask, as I reclaim my relationships with our traditional lands, we have been separated from along and around the eastern end of Lake Ontario. I have felt so much hurt and grieving in the land and waters. Have you experienced this in your work that you have been doing with the land? And if so, how does it come into your work? That's a great question, JP. JP is a colleague of mine. Yes, I can say that grief has come into the process. Um, when I talk about the work in homelands, it, there was a there is a grieving process because it's uh, um, we think about your ancestors that had to be removed or made that long journey from Upper State New York to. Which is now Six Nations, and what they had, what they left behind, their ancestors in the land, the pottery shards, the the pottery in the land, the community, the beauty, the beauty. So Upper State New York is beautiful. It is it's something that is rolling hills, streams, beautiful trees, 
um, all the way to the foothills of the Adirondacks and into the Adirondack Mountains. And there, and then we we say, oh, wow, this is like this was our home, and now we live in uh, Six Nations, which is mostly flat swamp area. <laughs> I think I have three swamps in the backyard. Um, so th there is a there is a grieving process. Uh, there's also a deep listening process, and there is um, through the through the work in the land there there has been moments of deep grief grief um, that comes through. But the work that we premiered Homelands was not about grief; it was about joy. And I think that was the most powerful thing that people got out of our show was the immense joy that the women had dancing and honoring our connections. So sort of like all of the emotions <laughs> come into it. And like anybody who's displaced or their home, any, it's a universal feeling. If you've been displaced from your home, you know what it means, how it feels to be walking your land. So walking where your ancestors walked or looking at what your ancestors looked at. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very powerful for me as an artist to be working in there. I think that's it. Oh, one last question. Your garden. My garden, yes. <laughs> well, um, uh, my family are gardeners. So off and on, my parents, we, we, we were gardeners, horticulturalists because of necessity of food. <laughs> my parents were very, very uh, poor when I was little. And um, so we always had a garden. And um, I only came to gardening a lot since the pandemic because I was just home. And then I started working and absolutely love it. And I feel like it's just something that has my ancestors did, I just align with it. And then um, one of the things that really makes it special for me is during the pandemic and every, all the theaters were closed and people were like having a meltdown because I can't perform, there's no theater. Um, I created a stage, I grew a stage, that was my project, I grew a sunflower stage. So I had a 360 sunflower stage with over 500 sunflowers. And we danced in the middle of, of the sunflowers. And then we were doing this work. And at the same time, the National Arts Center was doing a project called Dancing the Lands and a video project. And so that project, Ajija Goa, became a part of the um, Dancing the Lands. You can, you can go online and look at that at the National Arts Center. So, so this, this um, last, and I, each year I keep building it. Last year I added a sand stage. So it's sand and then there's the gardens and the food and yeah. So it's, it's my ongoing experiment of, of cultivating land and um, inviting people in to be a part of that process. And I have a lot of dancer friends from Toronto who are like, can we come and help you plant? I'm like, yes, you can. <laughs> you can weave too. And there's, you know, but it's really important to get your hands and feet in the earth. And that, that's really what, um, what is health, what is uh, grounding and it's uh it's it's good for your well-being um so most of the summer i'm completely covered in earth and dirty <laughs> and then covered in clay <laughs> thank you thank you so much uh, ayawe <laughs> I just wanted, I didn't put it up here, but it, we do have more information on the, um, the Howie Dance Theater website. Uh, very active on Facebook with events that are coming up, um, the Howie Dance. And um, we are having summer programming. So just stay tuned. And also we host people if they wanted to come and do a workshop in the land or a pottery workshop. Yeah, yeah I thank you so much. Hello, my name is Hello. 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 Hello.
Um, want to just again uh, say I, I love the fact that uh, Western University has been putting on these events to uh, focus on reconciliation and build the relationship with the uh, the indigenous communities that are around here. Um, so in uh, in my particular area, we have the uh, we are within the uh, the treaty area of a dish with one spoon, and um, that includes right now the uh, the uh, Onondaga Nation of the Thames, which is where I'm from. The um, uh, Chippewas of the Thames and uh, the, the um, what is it? Uh, oh my goodness, just had a brain loop. Anyway, Six Nations of Grand River as well, or Ishwikan as we call it. And so um, they're really trying to build those relationships and, and, and uh, create a, a space for healing. So the, where they had that event today is. Uh, something that they call the uh, Wampum Learning Lodge. It's at the uh, University of Western Ontario. And I'll show you real quickly here before we go. Um, what it, Welcome to the... What it looks like here, just so that you can see where they held today's event. Um, so let me, first of all, get this up. And I will switch, switch this so that you can see. Now, we also, um, Fab Feline just graduated um, this year, and they had his graduation celebration at the, uh, at the lodge as well. So this is where it is. Welcome to the Indigenous Learning Space. The space is going to be used as a hub for our Western community, Indigenous communities. This is where we want all of our activities to take place. Workshops, speaker series, social events, community engagement. We wanna keep this space as busy as possible. This space was designed with students in mind. Having a space like this where Indigenous youth can see themselves and want to attend this school because a space like this exists within Western, I think is probably the most exciting thing. This is a space where a lot of important work is going to be accomplished. I see it as a place of cultural reclamation, reconciliation, revitalization, respect, building those relationships between all of us. It's just a place of growth, of hope, of opportunity. And that's what students have been looking for. I'm just really excited to be able to invite everybody to the space. We want it to be a home away from home. So that is the uh, lodge. I'll show you um, kind of what the side of this building actually looks like. So this is the um, this is the lodge, and uh, outside this is brand this part is brand new. Now this circular. Uh, building is the actual lodge um, and the outside part here is where we do ceremony so we can have sacred fires and uh, things like that to um, to welcome visitors so for example Western University just about I guess it was last summer we had um, uh, the chief from Kaos uh, settlement come do a talk at the university and now typically there are two things that happen when people go from one one area to another area um, the host nation and in in our case we hosted the uh, the chief from Kawasis and um, we put on a welcoming ceremony this would normally be where we would do something like that now um, because it wasn't quite ready for us to do it last year when we did the, the the welcoming for us. We had the event held somewhere else, but we did a welcoming ceremony, and that allows for um, us to um, welcome in um, our visitors to have a, 
an acknowledgement and a feast. So we have food uh, always uh, when you're having a well, any of our all of our events um, involve having food. Um, but we had uh, food, and then um, and then he in turn does something that we call an acknowledgement, a land acknowledgement. And the and it's not so much a land acknowledgement per se as an acknowledgement of thanking for uh, for welcoming him as a guest onto our territory. Um, and so that goes with other places. If someone from our nation were to go out to Manitoba or BC or Alberta, is that we would expect that they would have uh, a, a welcoming ceremony and then we would do an acknowledgement as a way of thanking them for uh, for hosting us um, and being uh, being there uh, to welcome us. So Western University really is trying to build on the reconciliation of, as I was saying, that relationship between uh, the university and the indigenous communities around uh, that surround it because there are um, there are three very close communities um, to here, but there's also uh, some communities like uh, Kettle Point and Stony Point and Walpole Island and um, Oshuiken. They're all within, you know, uh, within the driving distance if it, you know it comes down to it. So, so they want to ensure that they are um, being respectful to all the uh, the nations, and, that, and I think that it's a great move forward for an institution. That there's there's obviously got to be some some kinks that get worked out along the way. But uh, but they're definitely in stepping in the right direction, and um, and I think that this um, this building is really uh, awesome to have for our ceremonies and the uh, and the ceremonial space on the outside is really great. So so even in the winter time or in the if it's raining and stuff and we can't do ceremonies on the outside, then we still have the building where we can still do ceremonies on inside indoors if we need it. Uh which is what happened uh <laughs> during graduation um a, a couple weeks ago. So, um that being said, I'm going to post a vod up of that uh event, uh the speech from Shanti Smith, so anybody who missed it can definitely check it out. Now, as I mentioned before, um, I'm going to take a, a dinner break. Um, we're going to um, probably walk our rodent and um, and that kind of thing. Uh, Van Testa Kitty and I will walk, walk the rodent and have our dinner. And I'll be back at 6 o'clock uh, to do uh, our music. And so we'll have our music night together. So if you want to hear some indigenous music and uh, make some requests and uh, potentially hear some artists that you may not have heard before, then I invite you to please come back and, and bring your snacks and drinks and kick up your feet and, and be ready to request some songs. And the, the music is from every genre. There are indigenous artists that cover blues, rock, hip hop, pop music, country, uh, anything that you can think of, there's a there's an artist who will who who, who will fit the bill for you. So definitely uh, feel free to uh, come back for that. So in the meantime, um, I think we'll we'll raid out. And um, I know that uh, the surfs actually have just started, and they have uh, they've raided me a number of times, and I feel like I should go back and um, and return the favor and I will hope that you would all stick stick around and uh, even if you don't stay for a long time just come over and say hi to the serfs and let them know that uh, that we support them and that, that we appreciate that their support of us as well um, so a couple of things I would do here uh, first of all I want to just let you know there's uh, always a way in this channel to be as in all inclusive as we can and to be as welcoming to everybody as we can and we want to build relationships here as well and so you know they say a friend is just a hello away and so you should just try it in whatever language you prefer whether it be an indigenous language uh, uh, or otherwise um, just say hello to somebody and if you're a streamer 
don't uh, be afraid to hit uh, command me. Let the people in our community know that you're a streamer so that they can uh, come and join you and follow you and see what you do. And that we can all share the support together. And so that's what we're doing there. In the meantime, um, I'm going to also put in the break calls. And so if you can copy whatever raid is uh, appropriate for you, um, that would be great. And then we'll go over and uh, see the service. And so let me just uh, make sure that they're actually in their channel. Okay. Yeah, it looks like they are in their channel. So we'll go over and uh, see them. And again, I'll be back uh, just around 6 o'clock or so as we start some music. So please come back and join us and uh, make some requests and, and chill out to some tunes. What they mean is that, A, there are words, phrases, or sentences being used that the parties involved are not wholly on the same page about, and B, that that difference is a minute and unimportant distraction from the topic, focus, or subject matter at hand. Look